fortunate today to have uh, Professor So Harada from the University of Illinois as a PQI uh, speaker. Uh, so got his PhD at the Institute of Molecular Sciences in Japan, working with Professor Iwata. He then came to the US, uh, spent a year work as a visiting scholar working with uh, Martin Head Gordon, uh, then spent a year with Rod Bartlett, the University of Florida. Uh, many of you would know that Rod is, uh, an, uh, is an expert in coupled cluster and equation of motion coupled cluster methods. Uh, so then moved to PNNL where he was a senior research scientist for several years before moving to the University of Florida as a faculty member in uh, chemistry. In 2010, he was recruited away from Florida to the University of Illinois, where he's now the Martin T. Schmidt professor, as well as the Blue Waters uh, professor. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, won the medal for the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Sciences, many other awards, but I say what really impresses me is the number of times he's been voted on campus as an outstanding teacher. So congratulations on that. That's <laughs> yeah, I'm very pleased uh, to be here. So, uh, so has worked on a wide range of problems. I think the common theme for many of these is uh, many body techniques. Uh, he's pioneered methods of doing perturbation theory and coupled cluster theory using Monte Carlo methods, uh, both for electronic structure and for problems in vibrational and hominicity. And more recently, he's been really working very hard on trying to uh, extend electronic structure methods into the finite temperature uh, regime. So without any further comments, let me turn it over. So. Right. Thank you very much for a very kind introduction. Let me uh, share my screen. Can you see um, my PowerPoint? Does it work? It's fine. Okay. Well, thank you again for the introduction and also for tuning in as well as this invitation. And I'm gonna talk about today, this uh, finite temperature of many body perturbation theory for electrons. And this is a work done by myself and my graduate student, Puneet K. Ja. So here's the contents of my talk today. First, I'd like to remind you um, audience that the extensivity of energy, which is the basis of thermodynamics, actually comes from the charge neutrality of the macroscopic system that we are describing. And then we um, ask ourselves this um, important or interesting question, or maybe even shocking question, is the textbook finite temperature many body perturbation theory really correct? And I'd like to convince you that um, it, is, it is lacking, it is not entirely satisfactory. And then we proceed to derive the analytical formula of the first and second order finite temperature perturbation theory that is much more satisfactory. And then we come back to this uh, question, which is known as the kahn ludinger conundrum, which ignited this uh, whole debate as to whether this uh, textbook theory is correct or not. So if you open any textbook of um, chemical thermodynamics, it starts by saying that energy is extensive, entropy is extensive, temperature is intensive, and so on and so forth. And these are the foundational assumption of the rest of the theory to be valid. And when I say that extensive energy is extensive, I mean that the energy is roughly speaking additive, or more strictly speaking, the energy is asymptotically proportional to the volume or the number of particles. So two cans of Coke, twice the calorie, that's something that is so ingrained to, into our common sense that even children know this without questioning. But if you really question why this is the case, it's kind of odd because the energy of the chemical system is a sum of pairwise interactions. And the number of pairwise interactions grows quadratically with the number of particles. So naively, we might expect that the energy should be proportional to the square of the volume of the system. But the fact that the energy is still linearly 
proportion of the volume or energy is additive is because the chemical system always maintain local charge neutrality. So we have nearly equal amount of positive charge and negative charge. So we have repulsive interactions between like charged particles and attractive interaction between oppositely charged particles. And they cancel almost exactly, leaving behind effective chemical interaction, which are very, very short range. So if you have these two cans of Coke, which, is, which are, let's say, one inch apart, they are not interacting at all in a chemical sense, which is the basis of extensivity of energy, which makes the thermodynamics works for this kind of system. But if you go to a different kind of physical system, such as gravitational system, then we only have positive charges. We only have attractive interaction, which are not screened at all. So they are very long range that reaches many light years. Then the energy is no longer extensive. So energy of two galaxies is not the sum of energy of individual galaxies. So then the thermodynamics, as we know it in the chemistry textbook, does not work for such a system. So even for a system which consists of electrons and so on, which violate this charge neutrality, then energy is no longer extensive again and the thermodynamics breaks down. So in, for example, charged plasma, you can see that the, the electrons behave completely differently from the electron in this kind of uh, neutral chemical system. So with this preparation, let's ask ourselves this um, rather striding question the many body perturbation theory at finite temperature described in many texts, but really correct. So this is the work led by my graduate student when he was a first year graduate student and he completed this in 30 years or so. So there are many widely used textbook of quantum many body theory for physicists or chemists at the graduate level. And all of these textbooks dedicate one chapter on finite temperature many body perturbation theory for electrons not for vibration, rotation, or translation, but for electrons in grand canonical ensemble. So in this theory, we first define or calculate the so-called grand partition function, which is the sum of this exponential where beta is the inverse temperature, E sub i is the ith energy, mu is the chemical potential, n sub i is the number of electrons. And this sum has to be taken over all possible states of all number of electrons. And this chemical potential is determined by satisfying this equation, which is nothing but the electron neutrality condition that I was talking about a few pages ago, where n bar is the average number of electrons, which exactly cancel the nuclear charge of the system. Now, if we determine this ground potential function with the correct chemical potential, we can tease out virtually any thermodynamic function from it such as ground potential, which is the free energy in the ground, ground canonical ensemble, or internal energy U, which is the Boltzmann average or thermal average of energy. And furthermore, if we um, define an operator C hat as such, which has the eigenvalue as a sum of the ground partition function, then we can see that um, the C hat satisfies this Brock equation which is isomorphic to time penetrating equation with imaginary time. So because of this isomorphism, we can actually reuse this diagmatic time dependent perturbation theory for the ground state energy solving the time penetrating equation for Brock equation to obtain this uh, various thermodynamic functions at finite temperature. So this is the very beautiful or elegant starting point of this finite temperature perturbation theory. However, its uh, implementation is extremely, extremely tedious to the extent that it's almost intractable to even arrive at the second order formula for the ground potential. I asked my postdoc to actually reproduce this and he came back with 40 pages of derivation. So again, it's based on time dependent diagmatic derivation using Matsubara's finite temperature Green's function of thermal weak theorem. It's a very, very tough stuff. And but worse yet, if you look into any one of these chapters, they um, actually point out, point, point to this um, rather important paper written by Walter Kohn and Joaquin Luttinger in 1960, 
exactly 60 years ago. And in this key paper, these two authors pointed out that there is a mathematical inconsistency between finite temperature perturbation theory that these textbooks are describing and zero temperature perturbation theory, which is completely well established by people like Meta Preset and Rayleigh Schrodinger, Rod Bartred, John Popo, Hugh Kelly, and so on and so forth. Specifically, they show that if you bring the temperature down to zero of the second order ground potential formula, it doesn't reduce to the Meta Preset second order formula. They differ from each other by this, uh, what they call the enormous diagram contribution for homogeneous electron gas, which is not only non-zero, but also is divergent. So this is a major inconsistency between these two theories. So on the basis of this inconsistency, these authors concluded that the bruckner goldston perturbation series is therefore in general not correct. So this is the last sentence in this famous paper, the last sentence in the introduction of this famous paper, which was really shocking, questioning the validity of the theory. So reflecting this um, key paper, you find a very bizarre statement in the textbook chapter that is describing this theory. For example, Ma Chiang and some Panther wrote that a node of caution is called for whenever we attempt to calculate zero temperature properties from an expression for the same quantities at non-zero temperatures T by taking the limit T goes to zero. The physics is not necessarily the same in both cases. So physics not the same at zero temperature and at finite temperature, which is very hard to swallow. Okay. It's almost like stadium itself is a little bit defeatist. But if you go to another Nobel Prize winner's textbook, DJ Farris textbook, he wrote, in any case, it serves as a warning against taking the result of perturbation theory too seriously, which is rather cynical. And he was referring to um, this con Ranger conundrum itself. So I gather from these sentences that um, there is a gaping hole in our understanding of this fundamental theoretical physics in the area of finite temperature perturbation theory. So there is an opportunity to make some progress here, but I didn't know how to proceed until um, Peter Knowles reminded me that um, there's a core definition of any perturbation theory in, a con in the context of different projects. And this definition is that nth order correction to any quantity x, according to the perturbation theory, is by definition the nth derivative of the same quantity x defined or calculated exactly, that is by what the chemists call the full CI method, full configuration interaction method with perturbation scaled Hamiltonian. And the derivative is taken with respect to this uh, dimensionless parameter lambda which multiplies this uh, perturbation operator V hat. So V lambda equals zero corresponds to a reference of the perturbation theory. Lambda equal one corresponds to the free interacting real limit. And this definition exactly matches this uh, usual perturbation expansion of this quantity X. So this definition is valid, not only for any perturbation theory, any reference, any partitioning of Hamiltonian or any quantity X. And it is surprisingly straightforward to do this um, thermodynamic calculations at the full CI or exact level. Because with full CI, not only do we have exact ground state energy, but also we have all excited state energy as well as ionized and electron type states energies. So we can brute force evaluate this um, ground partition function. We can also brute force solve this equation to obtain the chemical potential at the exact limit. And from these, we can tease out any thermodynamic functions such as entropy, ground potential, internal energy, chemical potential, and so on as a function of temperature all the way down to zero. And we see no inconsistency of this con Luttinger kind in exact limit. So going from this, um, what we call the thermal full CI to um, benchmark data for the several low order perturbation corrections of finite temperature perturbation theory is just numerically differentiating these um, numbers of various thermodynamic functions obtained by therm thermal full CI. So what I asked my graduate student, Puneet Jha, to do was to implement 
this method, which we call the Lambda variation benchmarks, to obtain this uh, several row line, several row order perturbation corrections of various quantities, and compare these numbers from with the numbers that he might obtain from the formulas that we find in the textbooks. And here is what he found. So the delta order finite temperature perturbation theory is known as the Fermi Dirac theory, which you can find in any solid state textbooks. And uh, it is a um, very elegant half a page derivation. It's almost unquestionable. And it defines the zeroth order ground potential omega zero, zeroth order internal energy U zero separately, both of which depends on this Fermi Dirac distribution function, which contains zeroth order correction to chemical potential, which needs to be determined by solving this equation, which is again, electron neutrality condition. Now, if you evaluate these, we obtain these blue colored numbers. Okay? I don't want you to read them, but I want you to notice that uh, they agree exactly with this around the variation benchmark obtained by finite difference differentiation of thermal full CI. So from this agreement, we have to conclude that the textbook formula at zero order found Dirac theory are correct. But if you go to the first order, this is no longer the case. First of all, it's rather challenging to locate the agreed upon first order correction formula. So there is a lot of confusion in the side of the textbook, but uh, we, seem to, we, we agree that this seems to be the first order correction to ground potential according to the textbook. But you cannot really find the discussion about the first order correction to chemical potential there is almost no discussion about first order correction to internal energy. Now, if you evaluate this formula, we obtain this red colored column and they do not agree with the first order correction according to the Ravda variation benchmark, especially at higher temperatures. So from this, we have to conclude that the textbook formula for mega Y is incorrect. U1 and mu1 are unknown. Similar situation at the second order. So this seems to be the second order correction to um, ground potential omega two. Mu two doesn't appear in the textbook and U two is unknown. Now, if you substitute temperature into this formula, we obtain these values, this red colored numbers, which do not look anything like the correct benchmark obtained from thermal full CI differentiation. Strangely, actually at low temperature, Omega two from the textbook resemble the benchmark result for U two, but they don't agree at higher temperature. So the textbook formula for Omega two is incorrect and U two and Mu two are unknown. So what's going on? So it looks like beyond the zero order Fermi Dirac theory, textbook finite temperature theory disagrees with the benchmarks and seems to be incorrect. So we are very shocked and also excited so we summarized this um, data and we circulated the results before publication to among uh, some small number of colleagues, so chemists and physicists who might have something to say about this. And many of them came back to us um, with the very constructive criticisms, which are very grateful to. And among whom were Alec White and Garnet Chan of um, Caltech. They went so far as to implement their own version of Ramp variation benchmark methods. And they found that the textbook theory can reproduce the benchmark results if and only if chemical potential is held fixed at any randomly chosen value in both cases, in both Ramp variation and textbook formula. So combining what they found and what we found, we can say that the textbook theory is wrong not so much mathematically as physically. The textbook theory does not vary chemical potential appropriately in, as perturbation order is increased to keep the system electrically neutral. Instead, the theory allows the average number of electrons and bar to fluctuate, making the system massively charged. And as we have seen in the first few pages of my presentation, in such a charged plasma, energy is no longer extensive and the chemical thermodynamics no longer holds. So the textbook is applying a mathematically semi-correct theory to a physically nonsensical situation. 
Put another way, the textbook perturbation theory does not converge at the, at the exact limit unless the exact chemical potential is known in advance, which defeats the purpose of perturbation theory as a converging approximation because we have to know the answer ahead of time. So now that we established that um, textbook finite temperature perturbation theory is somewhat lacking or not entirely satisfactory, can we derive the correct analytical formula for the more satisfactory finite temperature perturbation theory, which expands not only the ground potential or ground partition function, but also chemical potential and internal energy as a function of perturbation order? And the answer is yes. It's rather straightforward because if we can obtain the benchmark results by numerically differentiating thermal full CI data, we should be able to obtain the analytical formula by analytically differentiating the thermal full CI definition of the corresponding quantity. For example, first order correction to ground potential mega one is by definition the first derivative of the exact ground potential with respect to lambda. And exact ground potential is defined as such. And differentiating this formula, we arrive at immediately this is a sum over state type expression, analytical expression for the first order correction to ground potential, which we can write in this short height not notation. So this bracket means the zeroth order thermal average of this uh, bracketed quantity. We can also differentiate this uh, neutrality condition and arrive at the sum over state expression for first order correction, correction to chemical potential or differentiating this exact definition of internal energy, we obtain this uh, sum over state analytical expression for the first order correction to internal energy U. Now, the important point is that uh, these uh, perturbation corrections to energy are not to be identified with the Merapress perturbation corrections. Rather, they should be identified as Hirschfeld or certain general perturbation energy corrections. Because many of the excited states, many of the ionizing electron attached states are exactly degenerate at zero order. So we can no longer rely on Merapress perturbation theory, which is valid only for non degenerate reference. So we have to switch to this um, degenerate perturbation theory written by Hirschfeld and certain. And this is an absolutely um, amazing paper showing this uh, depth of intelligence and intellectual perseverance by these authors. So without this paper, I was unable to, I would be unable to uh, finish this project or another project. So these are the correct analytical sum of a state formula, which would be numerically verified as well in several pages later. But they are not very convenient formula because this involve, these involve the sum over all possible expansion many full CI states, not only for N electron states, but also ionized electron attached states. So we would like to compress these into a more compact reduced formula written in terms of molecular integrals. But this seems kind of uh, unlikely for the following reasons. So this is a behavior of um, Hirschfeld or certain general perturbation energy corrections. So if the reference, the zeroth order is non-degenerate, degenerate perturbation theory reduces to Merapress perturbation theory. And at each perturbation order, we have this closed formula written in terms of molecular integrals. However, for degenerate reference, such as this uh, red state, if you increase the perturbation order of general perturbation theory, this degeneracy tends to be lifted as we increase the perturbation order. And these um, perturbation corrections for this uh, within the general subspace are some kind of eigenvalues of effective Hamiltonian matrix. And these eigenvalues cannot be written in such a closed compact formula in terms of molecular integrals because they are at the mercy of the dimension of matrix and matrix elements and so on. So this makes it kind of unlikely to compress this kind of sum of a state's formula into a um, reduced formula. However, we still can. The reason is that even though we don't know what the closed formula for eigenvalues, we know the closed formula for the sum of eigenvalues because of trace invariance of the matrix as well as straight of condor rules. 
And in this um, sum over states, term average, all of these eigenvalues are summed with an equal Boltzmann weight. So it is the sum that we need, not the individual eigenvalues. And we need, we actually have the cross formula for the sum. So using these uh, sum rules of general perturbation energy corrections, as well as some combinatoric, combinatorics identities that we can derive on demand. So these are high school level algebra. So we can combine these to indeed arrive at the um, reduced analytical formula written in terms of uh, molecular integrals. So this is in, in the case of first order correction to ground potential. which actually differs from the textbook formula by this last term, which involves this um, first order correction to chemical potential. Also in the textbook, this chemical potential corrections are implicitly and incorrectly assumed to be zero in some cases. But we found that uh, it is given by this formula where this capital F is a thermal fork matrix. This first order correction to internal energy is rarely discussed. And we found that it is given by this uh, four term formula. And if you substitute temperature into these uh, new formulas, we obtain these uh, blue colored columns and they agree exactly with the lambda variation benchmark that uh, Pranit and myself obtained earlier. And I say, why not? Because this benchmark results obtained by a finite difference differentiation of thermal free cell data, whereas this new results obtained by analytical differentiation of thermal full CI formula followed by compression, followed by substitution, they should agree with each other if you did mathematics and computer programming correctly. On the other hand, the textbook formula gives rather different results, not because math they are mathematically incorrect, but rather because they are applying themselves to um, plasmas which is non-physical. Similar story, if you go to the second order, by analytically differentiating thermal full cell definitions of these quantities, we immediately arrive at the analytical sum over state type formula for omega-2, mu-2, and u-2. And starting from these and using the sum rules of Hirschfeld's certain general perturbation energy corrections, as well as various combinatorix identities, which we can derive on demand, we can arrive at reduced formula in terms of molecular integrals. So this is a textbook formula. And our new formula differs from the textbook formula in two terms, okay, both of which involves the corrections to chemical potential. And textbook formula for mu2 is basically unknown. And we obtain this formula, which is lengthy and u U2 formula is even lengthier, but uh, we can numerically verify this by substitution of temperature and we are arrive at uh, numerically exact agreement between this analytical formula and benchmark results. So having established that um, we have more satisfactory finite temperature perturbation theory, which expand chemical potential and internal energy on an equal footing as the ground potential, we can revisit this um, question raised by Cohen Ludinger, which ignited this debate as to the validity of perturbation theory at finite temperature. So in this paper, as I mentioned, these two authors were questioning what is the zero temperature limit of the second order correction to ground potential for homogeneous electron gas? does it agree with a second order correction to energy at zero temperature, okay, the zero temperature perturbation theory? So I'd like to ask the same question, but I'd like to first streamline this question. I don't want to compare ground potential and energy because they are rather different physical quantities. Ground potential has entropy term in it and also chemical potential term in it. So it's cleaner to compare what's the zero temperature limit of the second order correction to internal energy, which is nothing but the thermal average of energy. Does it agree with the, zero, the, the second order correction to energy according to zero temperature perturbation theory for general system, not just the homogeneous electron gas? And if the answer was no, it would be really shocking, but it may still be no because these authors 
kind of imply that. So this is just the first five, five terms of this U2 formula that I showed three pages ago. And the first two terms resembled MP2 energy expression for non hot four case. And indeed these two terms exactly reduced to MP2 energy expression if you, rate, if you lower the temperature down to zero. And the other three terms are multiplied by beta inverse temperature, which goes to infinity. And this is a red highlighted term, at, at, at least its diagonal term, is identified as this cohn rottinger anomalous diagram contribution, this programma programmatic term. It's actually a product of a factor which goes to zero at zero temperature and a factor that goes to infinity for generic ground state in the case of at zero temperature. And these authors argue that the infinity wins over zero. So this product goes to negative infinity, which um, is a major inconsistency from zero temperature perturbation theory. However, the same author, Rattinger and Ward, proposed a solution to this. They, they pointed out that there's always a term which contains a chemical potential which cancel this uh, divergent contribution. So if you look at this uh, more general formula, which works for all cases, we indeed find this uh, blue highlighted term which contains a chemical potential which behave exactly the same way as the temperature goes to zero with opposite sign. So these two terms actually cancel with each other. So this Rottinger and Ward prescription seems to work, not only for homogeneous electron gas, but also for general system because this formula is a general formula. And going back to the first order, which is much easier to handle, we see that um, the same mechanism is at play. So this is uh, full first order correction to internal energy formula, which contains only four terms. First two terms resemble MPY energy expression and the remaining two terms contain the factor of beta, which is individually divergent. And this red highlighted term looks like another anomalous diagram. It's a zero times infinity situation at zero temperature. And I don't know which of zero or infinity wins in this case, but it doesn't really matter because we see this blue highlighted term which contains a chemical potential which behave the same way as the temperature goes to zero with opposite sign. So they cancel exactly with each other at zero temperature, leaving behind just the first two terms, which goes to this formula if you let the temperature goes to zero, which is identified as MP1 energy expression for the reference. So in this simple case, there are only four terms and a very general situation we can say that the zero temperature limit of U1 is MP1 energy expression. So does this mean that the Rodinger and Ward hypothesis or pre prescription completely resolve this cohn rodinger inconsistency, at least at the first order in very general case? The answer is unfortunately no, because for a generic ground state, MPY energy is not the correct zero temperature limit. For the generic ground state, the correct zero temperature limit is the first order correction to energy according to Hirschfelder's certain degenerate perturbation theory, which is one of the eigenvalues of the effective Hamiltonian matrix, so typically the lowest eigenvalue, which cannot be written in a closed expression such as this. So in other words, the very fact that we could write this U1 in a closed expression written in terms of molecular integrals means that we can never, we can never allow this U1 to reach the correct zero temperature limit, which is a general perturbation energy correction, which cannot be written as in closed expression. So going back to the second order, let me check the time, okay. Going back to the second order, we have shown that this uh, anomalous diagram contribution was canceled by this um, term containing chemical potential, but we have other terms such as this one, which doesn't seem to have any counterparts that canceled this. And this goes to negative infinity for generic ground state. 
So summarizing, we found that the zero temperature limit of the first order correction to internal energy is MP1 energy expression, which differs from the correct zero temperature limit, which is the first order correction to energy according to degenerate perturbation theory. And zero temperature limit of the second order correction to internal energy is even divergent. And it's certainly different from the correct zero temperature limit, which is always finite. And we have uh, verified this conclusion by numerical calculations. We have applied this to square planar H4, which has degenerate ground state, degenerate reference. And if you look at the Fermi Dirac theory, this uh, zeroth order correction to internal energy, this black curve converges very nicely to the correct zero temperature limit. This is the dashed black line as we lower the temperature. However, if you go to the first order, this blue line, it converges to a finite result, but it differs from the correct limit, which is this dashed blue line. Now, if you go to the second order, this red curve, this um, second order correction dives to uh, negative infinity. And it's certainly different from this uh, correct limit, which is uh, this dashed red line. So at almost all the low temperature where this kind of theory may be expected to work, they actually don't work at all beyond the zeroth order Fermi Dirac theory. So this may be called the low temperature catastrophe or finite temperature perturbation theory. So I think I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to mention that root cause of this divergence or non-convergence is in fact the Boltzmann factor itself. So this Boltzmann factor is a prime example of a non-analytic function at t equals zero. And a non-analytic function is a function that is inf infinitely differentiable, so it's very smooth. Yet, it cannot be expanded in a converging perturbation series. I didn't know there's such a function existed, but uh, it exists. So if you concoct this kind of two-state function, two-state model of internal energy, you can actually relatively easily show that this function even though it's very smooth, it cannot be um, expanded in a converging Taylor series expansion, like, like this shows, depending on how this uh, function E0 and E1 behave as a function of lambda. Similar problem occurs when these two states crosses as a function of perturbation strength. This Taylor series expansion of this function converges to a wrong limit. It's finite, but it converges to a wrong limit at t equals zero. They converge everywhere if and only if these uh, two states energy do not cross and they are not degenerate at any point. So to, to conclude, we have um, derived the finite temperature perturbation theory that expands omega, u, and mu on an equal footing in a time independent and algebraic derivation. And we have shown that the finite temperature perturbation theory, whether the textbook version or, or our new version, has zero radius of convergence at t equals zero, when the delta order description is qualitatively wrong. And this non-convergence or divergence is not renormalizable by a clever choice of chemical potential, as um, implied by Luttinger and Ward, because this is caused by non-analytic nature of the Boltzmann factor at t equals zero. So this manifests itself not only in the grand canonical ensemble, but also in canonical ensemble, which has no chemical potential in it. So um, I'd like to thank all these um, colleagues of mine who have um, gave us uh, constructive criticism, especially um, Alec White and Garnet Chan. And uh, half of this work was done by my graduate student, Puneet Jha, who received the IBM Lefting Award in 1920, 1919, 2019, sorry, for this work. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So bef before we open up for questions, I just, you, you noticed that the Cone paper that you referred to, the very first one, Yes. That's when Walter Cohn was in Pittsburgh. 
He started this after Carnegie. 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 Yeah, Carnegie. That's before Carnegie and Mellon merged. I see. But the, the other thing that's really interesting is uh, Plessett was an undergraduate in physics uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. Wow. So you can see Pittsburgh played a significant role <laughs> yeah. in this. And I should tell my two students who are listening, and they probably know this, but they're academically related to Joe Hirschfelder, since my PhD advisor, Bob Silby, posed up with Hirschfelder. They developed Hirschfelder Silby perturbation theory. Interesting. Yeah. So, any questions? I, I have a question. Um, this was really interesting. So is the solution here to not use finite temperature perturbation theory and use finite temperature couple cluster or something? What, it, yeah, it, that's a bit it seems question. like it's not reconcilable. Yeah, I think that even cup cluster theory, which is, uh, which must be um, intimately tied to perturbation theory should have the same problem. Okay. If the reference is degenerate, if the reference is not degenerate, then there is no problem, both in perturbation theory and Kapkrasa theory. Okay. I haven't looked into Kapkrasa theory per se, but I, I imagine that it has the same problem. I have a, I have a question. Yeah, I was really fascinated by, by this uh, work. Um, so when I, uh, when I teach uh, quantum mechanics and I, and I teach perturbation theory to students, uh, uh, we get to the point of degenerate perturbation theory. Um, we talk about uh, some challenges of, you know, having to diagonalize uh, in the degenerate subspace of the perturbation, um, where some of these, uh, you know, divergences uh, go away. Is there, does, it, it, does what you were saying, especially toward the end of your talk, so some of the trace back to that origin, that um, fundamental problem, of like working in the right basis when you have this degeneracy? Yeah, that's another very important question. I think the answer is no. I think the, this Hirschfeld certain general perturbation theory, very reliable work works for any, any reference, not only for non general but also general cases and never diverges. However, if we sum them by multiplying this Boltzmann factor, suddenly this problem pops up because this uh, Boltzmann factor itself is a problem. So this like works like a switching function. Like for example, even when these individual states are correctly described by general perturbation theory, if we summary average it, as we go to zero temperature, like the weight of each state has to switch from this uh, initially this excited state to the ground state. And that kind of thing doesn't happen because of this uh, form of the function. So this is uh, probably a unique problem to um, thermodynamic perturbation theory, not from degenerate perturbation theory at zero temperature. Did you have a question, Amanda? Uh, I had just more of like a, a technical question. This, I mean, this is fascinating, but with the terms that you um, found that you had to add in like the, the second or the first order correction to the chemical potential and, and you as well, how, yes. how much more demanding does that get? Like what, for like a non-degenerate case where this would be applicable, what size of systems are you restricted to by adding in these terms or do they kind of come in at very little cost? Yeah, I imagine that it comes at no cost. No cost, okay. Yeah. okay. The chemical potentials, I think they need to be calculated, the correction mm -hmm. chemical potential, but I think the cost should be minimal. Very minimal, okay. Yeah. But to be honest so, with you, I think uh, all of these programs are really toy code at this point. Yeah. It's as ex expensive as doing full CI many times, <laughs> like first order, second order, and so on. But uh, okay. with this analytical formula, it can be implemented in a very, efficient way, just mm -hmm. that you know, zero, zero temperature, first and second order perturbation theory. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So, 
Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I have a follow up question on that. Again, I'm, I'm also very fascinated by the corrections, you know, to the textbook formulas. And I also noticed that, you know, uh, for both uh, first and second order correction terms, you know, they are temperature dependent. Uh, but it appears that the, the temperature dependence is different, right? So the first order at lower temperature seems that the correction is uh, close to zero, but that's not true for second order. I wonder what's the fundamental reason of the difference in terms of the sensitivity to the temperature in this correction term. Uh, you're, you're referring to the first order correction to chemical potential right. point zero at zero temperature, whereas yeah. the second order correction to chemical potential does not go to zero at t equals right. zero. Right, yeah. They, they, they are correct statements. And um, yeah, I don't have a simple answer to the second part, right? Zero temperature, this is almost zero, even though it's 10 to the fourth Kelvin, mm -hmm. it's, it's converged to zero temperature, it's not zero. Right. I don't have an easy answer for this, but um, zero temperature limit of mu one is zero. And right. this is related to um, the fact that the reference is Hartree Fock. I see. In other words, that um, the Fermi Dirac theory, we determine this uh, chemical zero order chemical potential in a, in a, in a self consistent way. And um, in, a similar, in a similar vein, that the orbital energies do not change going from zero temperature. Hartree Fock theory to first order perturbation theory. I think that first order correction to chemical potential also doesn't change. They're like a Koopman theorem kind of sense. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I, my answer is uh, clear, but uh, that's a kind of a rough, rough argument why this is expected. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. So you, I understand the focus is at low temperature but in thinking about your H4 test case, at the yeah. higher temperatures you have, that would ionize. And the only reason it's not ionizing is your restricted basis set, right? That's correct, yes. But since you're focusing on low temperature, this is not really a concern. Um, but what I'm saying is the yes. high, at high temperature, yes. these curves would look very different with a highly flexible basis set. That's correct, yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah, for example, entropy, right? Yeah, in, in reality, yeah. entropy is unlimited, right? It grows right, right. greater and greater, but in our calculation, we have a small basis set. So the number of states is very highly limited by right. the finiteness of basis set. So what you're saying is completely right. Right, so it's not just the finite states, the, uh, the continuum that comes in from the ionization is missing. That's correct, right. that's correct. So, your focus is on wave function methods. So what about finite temperature DFT and what, how that behaves in the zero temperature limit? Is there a problem there? No, I don't think so. I think um, zero order theory, Fermi Dirac theory, finite temperature Hartree Fock, finite temperature DFT, mm -hmm. they are probably free from this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think this is unique to perturbation theory especially at second order, but you know, the first order is related to Hartree Fock and DFT and first order has slight problems. So I have to be careful, but um, right. I imagine that- um, well, What about coupled right. cluster theory? Cup clusters should have the similar non-convergent- No problem. Yeah. Right. I don't know if it manifests as a divergence, but I think um, it should have the same problem because it comes from this uh, Boltzmann factor itself. It's very hard to avoid. Right, right. Very hard to fix either. That's what I think. So you have to switch to a free variational kind of method. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Let's see, are there any other further questions or? So like truncated finite temperature CIs? That should, that should work, I think. In the same sense that the full CI that we had thermal full CI a long time ago, and we had no problem computing them and no, no inconsistency at zero temperature and finite temperature and so on. So if you truncate it, I don't think there would be a problem either. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. In Thanks. in the tables that you had early, where you were showing <laughs> first and second order results, what was the system? Uh, that was H four. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, so they were all no, no, also H that was HF hydrogen four. HF because I thought the energy looked way off for H four. Okay, so that was HF. Okay, that's right. Okay, further questions. Okay, so you have a, the paper submitted in 2020. Can you remind us where that's submitted? And is it on the archive? Yeah, it's in, our, in archive. It's being reviewed by Physical Review A today. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think this would be a good paper to cover in one of my group meetings. You guys mm -hmm. hear that? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, so we'll track it down. So if there are no further questions, I, I want to thank you very much. I mean, this, this was very elucidating. Uh, and I've already encouraged, encouraged all my students to check out the, the video. So are these available in real time, Jeremy, or they, is there a delay? Uh, we mean like, it's like a 10 second delay for right now. Yeah, okay. It's basically live stream right now, but it'll also be archived. It'll be archived, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I want to thank you again. This is uh, fantastic. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, and we hope uh, when the world gets back to normal, we can actually have you on campus sometime. Yeah, I was looking forward to it. Yeah, it would be a very interesting meeting because not only there are chemists, but also other people. So it's yep. interesting. Okay, so I'm going to say 